It's April 15th, 2021. I'm Caleb Hendricks. I'm an intern with the Center for the Study of Tobacco and Society. And I'm here today with Dr. Alan Blum to discuss the medical journal editorship collection that I have been working with that documents his time as editor of both the Medical Journal of Australia and the New York State Journal of Medicine. And if I may, Dr. Blum, I would like to take you uh, directly to the collection and bring up one of the first key items, chronologically speaking. It's a, a letter dated October 16th, 1981 from uh, Sir Keith Jones addressed to you, offering you the editorship position at the Medical Journal of Australia. And the first thing I wanted to do was to ask you if there were any circumstances leading up to this letter that you might like to highlight for anyone interested in the collection and also what led you to take the position and move, if I understand correctly, all the way from Chicago, Illinois to Sydney, Australia. Caleb, first I want to thank you for uh, working on the collection as an intern from the School of Library and Information Studies and being one of uh, Dr. Ryder's uh, greatest students ever. We really appreciate the work that you've done in helping to make sense of the collection and to Kevin Bailey for coordinating this session for us to be able to uh, um, talk about that before you graduate soon uh, and get your master's in uh, library science. I, uh, the story of the Medical Journal of Australia editorship is, is unusual. I never imagined uh, I would be going there. That letter from Sir Keith Jones was literally the first letter I'd ever gotten from a sir. And um, I guess the, the, the story goes back to um, our being in Chicago. My wife, Doris, and I moved to Chicago where I accepted the Morris Fishbein Fellowship in Medical Journalism at the Journal of the American Medical Association. I thought I did pretty well and, and uh, I knew the editor quite well, Dr. Bill Barclay. And one night he asked me if I was interested in um, a contributing editorship, which would have been uh, a one day a week position to come in and work on manuscripts. And that would have been a, a remarkable opportunity for me. But um, as it turns out, he broke the news to me at the end of the fellowship that his, his request for this position hadn't come through. And so on the day of <clears throat> the, the end of the fellowship, I was escorted out the door of the Journal of the American Medical Association by two armed guards. <laughs> Um, dating back to the fears of Scientology days. And um, I really was looking for another position. Um, <clears throat> I had uh, done a, uh, a talk at Lutheran General Hospital uh, in Park Ridge, Illinois during my fellowship. <clears throat> and the uh, president of the, of the hospital had actually invited me to um, uh, look him up sometime if I ever needed a job, but I didn't. <clears throat> and uh, instead tried to look around. And um, one of the things that I uh, uh, looked into was doing a clinic on, a, in a, on, on the second floor of a drugstore and all sorts of things, but nothing worked out. So I called um, the, this uh, president's hospital and I wound up working at Lutheran General Hospital for the following year, which was really a long commute. It wasn't uh, as rewarding as I'd hoped it would be. And I started looking in the New England Journal of Medicine classified ads for another position and saw this amazing ad for the editorship and deputy editorship of the New York, of the um, Medical Journal of Australia. I said, wow, that's interesting. Not many editorships are advertised like that. Um, and if I don't get the editorship, maybe I can get the deputy editorship. So I, I sent in my uh, application and just about a week later, I um, got a call from the medical journal. Uh, would you be interested in meeting with us uh, when we come to the United States? We're going to be going to New York. Can you get to New York and uh, meet with us because we're interested in you as a possible candidate? So I thought that was a great idea. I flew to New York and um, on the afternoon of October some something uh, 1981, I met at the Algonquin Hotel with um, two members of the uh, Medical Association. They were actually also on the board of the publishing company, which was owned by the Medical Association. And one was George Reppin, who was the Secretary General of the Medical Association. That's the word for Executive Vice President here. And the other was a 
a fellow named Richard Walsh, who was a, a kind of a, a enfant terrible of the publishing world and had become the head of a publishing company owned by Kerry Packer, who was one of Australia's two leading publishers, the other being Murdoch. And we had a wonderful little discussion at the Galgonquin Hotel. And uh, um, a week later, I was at home and uh, I get a phone call and I hear, hello, is this Dr. Alan Bloom? I said, yes, it is. This is Sir Keith Jones. Um, would, would you like to become the editor of the Medical Journal of Australia? And I just couldn't believe it. I, I'm stammering and I, I didn't know what to call him. What do you call him, Sir Jones? Uh, uh, so I really didn't know what to say, but that was the Sir Keith Jones who followed up with a letter to me uh, that you saw dated October 16th, 1981. I was so ignorant of what an editor would earn or what an editor uh, would travel to Australia to do that I didn't ask anything about the job other than what I'd read in the classified ad. And I didn't even ask about salary. But he offered a salary that I that my brother thought was a bit too small. And I called him back and I said, could I possibly get this salary? He says, sure, my boy. So that's how I negotiated a slightly higher salary. I think it was from 40000 40, to $45,000 a year. Um, but the, uh, the move was necessitated because things weren't working out at the uh, Lutheran General Hospital. Uh, Doris was up for an adventure, but moving 10,000 miles away uh, proved to be quite an adventure. We moved on uh, in the new year, uh, I think it was literally on January 1st, uh, uh, 1982, and it was minus 20 degrees in Chicago. And after the long flight from uh, Los Angeles, uh, stopping off in Honolulu for a day where our son got locked in the um, bathroom at the uh, Pink Palace uh, Hotel, the, the famous uh, hotel on the shores of Waikiki. We arrived in Australia and it was about 90 degrees. <clears throat> so in two days, we went from minus 20 to 90. And um, that was the beginning of a very strange year in Australia. <clears throat> And uh, just from there, I was wondering if you would care to reflect on what your editorship work entailed at the uh, Medical Journal of Australia beyond the important efforts of your with the tobacco issue, or if there were any aspects of your work you would like to highlight that the collection itself may not capture. Well, one thing is certain when you move to a different country, uh, using street maps uh, and geography of the region to get your sense of where you're gonna be doesn't match up with the real thing. Um, I did get a call from one of the people arranging for our move in Australia to ask me what my accommodation needs were because in Australia, uh, differently from the United States, um, you receive accommodation as part of the job. You get a title on the door, um, and you, you get temporary accommodations, uh, and you, which you can keep or you can uh, trade and, and, and find your own. Uh, but it was necessary for us to have uh, a place to stay. And uh, I didn't know whether it was going to be a small house or a nice apartment. But all I said to them, man, was that we have a, uh, an 18-month-old child, and we'd like a little space to be able to let him... Um, uh, learn to walk and roam around the neighborhood and so forth. And uh, what we got was a fourth floor walk up with a bed that came down from the wall for the three of us. And they moved in a crib, uh, which our son had never used. Uh, and it was pretty awful. Uh, it turns out too that Newtown, which was where we were put, uh, was one of the neighborhoods that might not have been where the average person moving to Australia would want to go. It was there because they, we, they put us there because I had said uh, to my discredit that I wanted to try to walk to work if at all possible. But little did I realize that the area in which the medical journal was located was in the district that was ranked roughly 482 out of the 484 uh, districts in terms of quality of life. Um, the walk was nice though, across the campus of Sydney University, but the actual neighborhood of Newtown was not. And um, that presented a problem for my wife, Doris, who was forced to stay in this little crummy apartment all day long and fend for herself while I went on to the medical journal. The, um, uh, the, 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 they had not really told me what 
to expect and sort of why, in fact, uh, they needed a new editor and a deputy editor. It turns out that both of the editors had resigned in disgust over the manager of the uh, journal that they had brought in because they felt they needed a professional manager rather than a, a medical editor. And the editors became subservient to this new managing publisher. Uh, he turned out to be, I think he had a pharmaceutical background. It looked as though everything that I walked into was geared to the needs of the pharmaceutical advertisers. And this did not make me happy from day one. Then I was called to meet with the publisher, uh, with, the, uh, with the head of the board of, of, of the medical journal, who I assume was Sir Keith Jones. And I couldn't wait to meet him. Anybody who was a knight uh, must be pretty good. But what I learned was that I would be meeting a fellow named Lindsay Thompson. And um, Dr. Thompson was not at all like Sir Keith Jones, who I did get to meet and get to know pretty well, who was a really genuinely wonderful person. Uh, not so for Dr. Thompson, who was uh, a scowler from the moment I met him and who would refer to me as my dear boy. Um, pretty nasty character, and we didn't get along from the outset. He basically gave me the, the marching orders. I felt betrayed really from the outset, not having ever even known that there had been a palace coup from the time that I was offered the job to when I arrived. And uh, Thompson had forced out Sir Keith Jones, who had served as the acting editor, as well as the head of the board of the medical journal. But among my duties were not only getting out a journal every two weeks, but also uh, managing a library. Uh, which was being carted out of the building when I arrived. And I said, what, what is going on? They said, we're, we're taking the library out because the publisher says we don't need that anymore. Well, I said, let's get back in the building and bring it right back. And I stood my ground and we had a library that I was able to take advantage of to look for references in journals as to, to check on articles and how current and relevant and accurate they were. You need a library. This was before the internet. So we worked with volumes. And that had several hundred volumes that I very much needed to be the editor of a medical journal, something that the managing publisher hadn't appreciated. And he was about to let the librarian go, but I was able to uh, actually hire a, a librarian for the collection. The, um, uh, the other staff members included a copy editor who was basically a, a proofreader. Um, and she had been there for years. She was a, uh, I couldn't tell whether she was a survivor of the Holocaust or perpetrator of the Holocaust, because she was she was a bit um, bit uh, uh, adamant about everything she did and a bit domineering and uh, but a very nice woman on the surface and um, uh, I just never inquired of her personal background um, but a very heavy Eastern European accent. Um, I was able to bring aboard a couple of people, um, but several people left. And I did uh, meet a, a wonderful new copy editor who uh, was, was really one of the first new um, folks that, that worked out very well. And I had a great secretary. But what I didn't know was something that happened every morning at 1030. I'd hear a little noise outside my office and people would be gathered and talking. And I sort of closed my door because I didn't really want the noise. And then the secretary broke the news to me that that was the tea time that everybody was pretty much expected to be there for. And so I learned all about having a tea in the morning and one in the afternoon. And it really was to my benefit because it made me more of a social presence at the journal. But um, really, my job consisted of, of, of trying to go through lots of manuscripts that had been stacked up. I didn't have a deputy editor at the time, and that's who I tried to bring aboard. But the board kept opposing uh, my wanting to bring aboard um, a person of my choosing. Uh, they even ha had a candidate for me to interview that they brought all the way from London, a very nice fellow uh, named Richard Barling. We got along famously, but um, he had reservations and, and I wasn't comfortable with having somebody picked for me and we parted on good company. And then I was able to advertise for my own deputy editor. Several people uh, applied and the one who stood out was a woman named Kathleen King, who was a microbiologist who was unemployed at the moment and worked out as a, as a really good knowledgeable literary editor. Uh, she was able to work with peer reviewing the manuscripts while I went all over the, the country of Australia speaking and trying to drum up more people to 
uh, send their manuscripts to the Medical Journal of Australia, which had not been the case for many, many years. Um, most of the good pieces went to the Lancet or the British Medical Journal, and the Medical Journal of Australia was mainly a repository for articles that had often been rejected elsewhere from the major journals in Britain. Australia is a very British country, very imitative of America, um, and it didn't really have as much indigenous culture as I might have expected. The indigenous Australian culture is, of course, Aboriginal, and that was a whole education in itself. I, I, I never really understood, and I only wish I had understood more of Aboriginal culture, but clearly this was a British hierarchical culture uh, who, that hadn't even let in non-British um, immigrants until after World War II, an almost entirely white culture where Aboriginals had been massacred uh, upon the arrival of the first settlers uh, beginning in 1788. The first fleet came to Australia in 1788. And uh, believe it or not, when I was listening to the BBC one morning, the grandson of one of the members of the first fleet was uh, calling in a radio show. And that had to do with, if you, if you figured it out, one of the settlers was very young when he got there had a family, and then when he was very old, in his late 70s, early 80s, he married a young Australian woman and had children, and that persisted for two more generations with um, older men marrying younger women, and lo and behold, I heard a grandson of a member of the First Fleet on the radio in Australia in 1982. Well, you anticipated several questions I had Related to the journal itself. Reading through the collection, you get a sense that the journal was quite disorganized and at the same time that there were a handful of staff members that treated you rather coldly. And one item kind of stuck out in particular is a memo from, uh, I believe it's Joff Hill. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right. And it really comes across as rather malicious in which he warned you not to attend the National Medical Media Council meeting. I was curious, this, this one particular item probably sticks out more than most others from this part of the collection. I was wondering if you could give any context for it. Well, this is why I was so pleased that you were able to go through the collection and from your vantage point, pick out things that, 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 that intrigue you. And that's certainly one of the most intriguing uh, memos in the entire collection. I had gotten there and uh, learned that the contents of the journal, because uh, we had these big boards and we would paste the galleys of what was going to go in a given issue on the boards. And um, <clears throat> we would figure out the contents several weeks in advance. And much to my dismay, I learned that the contents of the journal were given in advance to the pharmaceutical advertisers so they could decide whether they would advertise their pharmaceutical product, their medications, in a given issue. Let's say if there was an article on thyroid conditions um, in a given issue, that's when the thyroid th the thyroid replacement hormone manufacturer might um, want to advertise. And that's not really considered ethical, in my opinion. You're not supposed to have any content that is related to an advertiser. <clears throat> but this was standard practice at that journal. And um, in fact, one time at the Lancet, uh, the Lancet issued an apology because an ad for a certain drug appeared opposite an editorial about that drug, and it was totally by accident. But nonetheless, the editors felt so embarrassed that they issued a public apology. Well, no such apology is at the Medical Journal of Australia because that was standard practice. And my first um, act really as an editor was to stop that practice. And that it did not endear me to the uh, publishing manager who was responsible for the finances and much of the revenue came not from membership or from subscriptions, but from drug advertising. I also wanted to broaden the advertising to include non-pharmaceutical things, but that's not what pharmaceutical advertising journals want. They want only drug ads. They don't want physicians' undivided attention. But um, I had incurred the wrath of the pharmaceutical industry with a couple of editorials, uh, one called The Fleeting Hopes and Promises of Pharmaceutical Advertising, in which I brought together a group of uh, antibiotic ads that had appeared in the medical journals over the preceding four decades since the uh, uh, invention of penicillin 
in the late 19 in the 1940s and the advertising of penicillin beginning in the late 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. And I included ads for um, uh, antibiotics that had since developed lots and lots of resistant strains because they were overprescribed. And I included a little collage of these ads and that it was a very brief editorial, just saying that we need to be mindful about prescribing antibiotics because the more we prescribe, the more resistant strains of bacteria uh, emerge. And that infuriated the industry and uh, a couple of other articles I did. Um, and, and so I was banned from the monthly luncheon meeting, a gourmet lunch, I might add, at, at uh, one or another of the finest restaurants in Sydney between the editors of the medical journals in Australia and the uh, executives of the pharmaceutical industry in Australia. They would all come to Sydney once a month to schmooze with the editors and of course, show how convivial everything was, how everybody uh, patted each other on the back and we did favors for each other. I, I, I never understood this other than it was a great meal and clearly there to impress the editors that if you play ball with us, you'll get these gourmet meal, meals for life. Um, so I think that, that Jeff Hill thought that by, by banning me from these meetings, that that would really upset me, that I would feel deprived that I was not able to schmooze with the pharmaceutical executives of Australia. I thought it was the coolest thing in the world to get a, that's, I wear that, that memo as, as one of my greatest uh, testimonials. And I included it in my annual report at the end of the year as the moment when things became fairly overtly hostile between the publishing manager and me. Um, but I didn't give any ultimatums other than uh, one night when they pulled um, a manuscript um, from, uh, from the, the board. One night, apparently, the, uh, this Lindsay Thompson sent in people to go <laughs> look through what we were planning, and he pulled out a certain article that he didn't like. And I couldn't figure out where was this art? Where did it go? And I heard that they had taken it away. I basically did give an ultimatum. Uh, basically, if you do that again, I'm going to leave. And I haven't been here that long, and you just lost two other editors. So I just don't think that's what you want. And they said, well, you're very hostile to pharmaceutical advertisers. Well, I don't think that, that we should be worrying about pharmaceutical ads. That's not our agenda. Our agenda is to have good, credible medical information that is not biased by pharmaceutical advertising. And I also refused to edit supplements, uh, supplements that were uh, produced by the pharmaceutical companies that they would ship a bunch of articles to you on a certain topic and you were supposed to approve them and they would then handle the whole thing on their own and that would be included with the every other week copy of the medical journal. And I said, fine, I'll be happy to continue publishing these supplements if I get to peer review them. And they said, oh, no, 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 we have our own peer reviewers. I said, but you're drug companies. You, you, you can't, you're not able to peer review your own drug company finance material. So we I don't mind it being financed by a drug company as long as you're up front about that. But the editor has to handle peer review of a medical journal, not the drug companies. And so there were no further uh, examples under my watch of any kind of uh, supplements for the uh, Medical Journal of Australia. Um, I think as a result, drug advertising went down. But again, that's not my worry. That's the worry of the medical society. They have to choose whether this is a benefit of membership whose, whose membership dues are supposed to pay for, their, uh, for this journal. We're not supposed to necessarily rely on drug ads. Although New England Journal of Medicine, believe it or not, the, the greatest American journal gets enormous millions and millions of dollars from drug ads every year. And so do all the major leading journals, the Journal of the American Medical Association, others. And um, there aren't many journals that can, subs that can, subs can uh, subsist with just um, subscription costs. So the drug companies do pay a lot of this. And I think that leads to a lot of problems about the medical literature. But in any event, the, uh, the, the relationship was terrible and um, I wished it had been different. Um, I, I finally, at the end of the year, left the journal and, and, and we can talk a little bit more about what happened after that. But as for the actual journal itself, uh, there was always tension and um, I loved it because I was able to set my own hours and stay in my office and edit lots and lots of articles and lots and lots of, and write lots of, art, of editorials and get together a good group of peer reviewers and others on the staff. 
This is a little bit more on a, a side note. There are multiple references to, uh, I believe it's Boga Up is how you're supposed to pronounce it. It's a lot of references to this in the correspondence related to the Medical Journal of Australia. As I understand it, this was a group known at the time for like refacing billboards for cigarettes and alcohol. And uh, I was curious to know, and I think others reading through the collection would be curious to know what the connection of the group was to their journal. There's just a number of references and it doesn't, there's not quite enough context within the collection itself to get a clear understanding. I'm not, I don't remember whether I'd known much about Bugger Up before I went to Australia or, or whether I wound up uh, uh, investigating the situation myself. But of course, when you go to Sydney in the early 1980s and you look around the town, you see just about every billboard for um, uh, cigarettes, alcohol, soda, and uh, which they call lolly water in, in Australia, and, and, and sexist ads, uh, ads like for lingerie and, and, and women's bodies on billboards and things. These were all graffitied. And it's so striking when you went to Sydney, you'd see literally the billboards for um, you know, fruit or for a supermarket completely fine, uh, but any billboard for cigarettes had some incredible graffiti on it. And uh, that was, and they were signed bugger up, which stood for billboard utilizing graffitists against unhealthy promotions. And um, I determined to meet the people in bugger up because these were, this was my interest with cigarette advertising and uh, this was an, this was a, a, a hidden group because what they were doing was illegal. And I did not know how I was gonna meet them. How do you go and meet people who by night, presumably are going and spraying graffiti on billboards at the risk of arrest? And I just happened to go, uh, I did a lot of walking in Sydney and I went to a little a neighborhood that had what was called a milk bar. And that would be like a little coffee shop and sandwich shop. And um, this was a Lebanese milk bar. And I noticed on one of their walls was a Marlboro ad that had been refaced. And um, it was hilarious. It was the, the, the horse coughing and, and saying, phew, this guy stinks. And uh, I thought this was, this was it. This was a bugger up sign, but it was framed and it was inside. So I figured that the owners of this milk bar must really like bugger up because they didn't sell cigarettes. They also were vegetarian. I think they were a Muslim owned um, uh, milk bar. And as I went back, I got to know the owners and I happened to ask, I said, by the way, that's, that's a great ad. It's, oh, that's the bugger up people. They're great. They come in here all the time and they have their meetings here. <laughs> so I got to, I got to, get to know him. And then one night I was introduced to the people at Bugger Up and we, we bonded instantly. And um, uh, I even went to court as the editor of the Medical Journal Australia. I identified myself as such to help uh, uh, get one of the, the taggers, one of the graffiti artists uh, off. He was a World War II veteran. He walked around Sydney uh, in, in tattered clothing and, and often barefoot. But he always had his spray can and when he'd come across a cigarette billboard, he'd come up with something clever. And um, he was quite a character um, and he did get off on that on that case. Um, but there were um, uh, 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 there were just an amazing bunch of bugger up stories. The, the best one was uh, during the preceding Christmas of 1981. Uh, the folks at Bugger Up knew that for the two-week Christmas holiday, where everybody is off work, nobody works during that holiday, um, that the people who post the billboards uh, and who paint them would be off as well. So they found the largest billboard in all of Sydney. It was a Marlboro billboard on top of, of a fairly, we wouldn't call it a skyscraper, but it was only about 10 or 12 stories high, but you could see it throughout all of Sydney. And they somehow got on the roof and they refaced the um, Marlboro billboard. And so when people awoke on the following business day, everyone could see this, uh, you know, incredibly graffitied up uh, Marlboro sign. And I'll have to get out the actual um, uh, logo for it, which we wrote about in the, as a cover story for the Medical Journal Australia. 
and uh, it was uh, it was it made it made international news because we were in effect glorifying an illegal ad for the bugger up people. And just before we went to publish, we received a letter from the law firm of, and I kid you not, Sly and Russell, uh, uh, ordering us not to publish the article on Bugger Up because that would be something that would be defamatory to them, Philip Morris Tobacco Company, their client. And uh, we proceeded in any case. Uh, I did have the good fortune to meet a law student at the University of New South Wales named Chris Hunt. And uh, Chris took an interest in the journal. I think I had read something he had written in the legal field and I'd sent him a manuscript to review and he did such a good job. I asked him if he would be one of our regular reviewers. And then when it looked like uh, I was being pressured by the medical society to do all sorts of things that I didn't think were ethical, I kept consulting him more and more. And uh, I would send memos back that to this day, until this interview, I do not think anyone in that medical society ever understood how I could learn so much about the law in such a short time being in Sydney, Australia, to be able to defeat every one of their arguments of what I needed to do and shouldn't do. But Chris was a brilliant lawyer. He wound up graduating from the University of New South Wales and working for many years for the Commonwealth of Australia in the tax field. But without Chris, I, I would have left a lot sooner. He guided me through my annual report uh, we knew that every word that I wrote was true and not libelous, and I wound up leaving that annual report on the desks of every member of the board of the uh, medical publishing company, who were uh, consisting of members, uh, mostly members of the Amer of the Australian Medical Association, and I gave a copy to every member of the board of the Australian Medical Association before I left. We're still in the midst of COVID. We're on Zoom. We were trying to avoid this technical issue, but we'll have to split this up into multiple videos. So, so. Well, at least one more. I think that uh, to conclude on Bugger Up, uh, this was a wonderful spirited group of people from all walks of life. There was a physician. I don't mind saying that was Arthur Chesterfield Evans, who ironically had applied to become my deputy editor, but he had no editing experience whatsoever, but what a great guy. We stay in touch to this day. Arthur made a wonderful film called Confessions of a Simple Surgeon about he, uh, how, how he would join the group and graffiti billboards and uh, was arrested. Um, and he became later a member of the New South Wales Parliament, um, running on a, on a, a fringe uh, party ticket. But in New South Wales, there's proportionate representation. So he did get a section of the vote and he was a member of the New South Wales Parliament. Um, Brian Robeson was a personal friend. He was a computer expert and he would travel by night and find things to graffiti. And one morning as I was walking to um, take the train downtown, um, I saw an old uh, abandoned vehicle and on it, on the, uh, the vehicle was spray painted 4AB. And uh, the, the graffiti on it was Marlboro made me a wreck. And he dedicated the graffiti for AB, for Alan Blum. Um, so one of my greatest honors was getting a graffiti dedicated to me by a member of Bugger Up. And uh, when I left the journal, actually, I was given a golden spray can, uh, one of the trophies that I, I revere the most. Um, but uh, I never did spray can a, a billboard. I, I never did accompany them on their billboarding uh, graffiti activities, but I admired every one of them. And their, their link to their website, we, we revere, we put it on our website, and we have a great collection of bugger up material in our archive. That was the best cover uh, we did and um, uh, got a lot of attention, got some criticism too, but it made the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald and the Melbourne Age, the two leading newspapers in Australia. 